Hi and welcome to day three of Uppsala Health Summit, Pathways to Lifelong Mental Well-Being. For those of you who attended the workshops yesterday, I hope you had an interesting and productive afternoon. The rest of us will hear about that uh, tomorrow at the end of the summit. If any of you uh, have missed uh, a speech uh, or any of our interesting speakers, all the talks will be published on our website in uh, just a day or two. So keep your eyes open for that if you missed something. And uh, today, as the rest of the days, please put your questions in the chat. We will have a few minutes after our three speakers today to uh, get some questions going. So please put your questions in the chat if you want to. Now today, we will focus on our youth and our adolescence and the effects and impact of social media. Is it good or bad or perhaps a little bit of both? And is it effective? Now we have three interesting speakers, all of them from the US. And first, let me introduce to you Dr. Uh, Nick Allen, Professor of Clinical Psychology, Psychology at the University of Oregon in the US. Now, good morning, Nick. I think it's super early or maybe still night where you are. Good morning. Yes, it is 5 a.m. for me. So I think that's that's the morning or the night, depending on your usual habits. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for being with us, despite the early hour then. Um, uh, now, as well as a professor at the university, you're also a co-founder and CEO of Kasana Health Incorporated, a company whose mission is to use research, evidence and modern technology to revolutionize the delivery of mental health care. You aim to develop a new generation of just-in-time behavioral interventions of mental health problems. Now, please tell us more about this interesting development and perhaps mostly from the adolescence perspective. Welcome, Nick. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction and good, good morning or good afternoon to everyone there in, in Sweden and anywhere else people might be watching. It's a great honour to be asked to speak to you today and I, I, I'm really looking forward to not only hearing all the presentations but the discussion afterwards. Now, I want to start by saying that I, I, I titled my talk Digital Pragmatism, and the reason I did that was because I wanted to um, emphasise that digital technology is with us and is part of our lives, and that is not going to change. And so I think the critical question is how do we leverage digital technology for its maximum advantage in the area of mental health, and how do we set up uh, regulation, education and good uh, digital design to minimize the risks associated with digital technologies. And that's going to be an important theme in my talk today. So as you know, we are focusing on adolescents and teenagers, and I, I won't uh, belabor this point because everyone will know that the central role now that digital devices and particularly social media play in the lives of adolescents. Uh, so digital devices are primarily devices of communication. And of course, adolescents are extremely interested and motivated in uh, to, to communicate and to, under, and to understand their social world. And, and so these devices are really central to that task. And you can see here is some uh, data from the Pew, Center, Pew Research Center. Uh, giving you an idea, this is of course data that's now a few years old. And it's from 2018, and this, and this emphasizes uh, the rapid changes that occur in this area. As you can see, there is no mention here, for example, of, of, uh, of TikTok, uh, which is a, a, a platform that really is dominant now in adolescents' lives and their uses of uh, digital media, just giving emphasizing the rapidity with which things change in this area. And uh, as you can also see from this uh, data from the Pew Centre, uh, many, many adolescents describe themselves as online almost constantly, uh, and, and the vast majority would be uh, online several times a day. So once again, this, uh, this emphasises the importance. Now, from a developmental point of view, it's important to ask why are these devices so important to adolescents? And they offer various affordances that are really critical to the key developmental tasks of adolescents. So, for example, as I mentioned before, uh, social communication and social connection is a key developmental task. 
and the devices really facilitate this. Uh, there's also the ability to experiment with identity, which is a really important uh, developmental process of adolescence. And this, you can see this uh, reflected in the way adolescents use different kinds of accounts to reflect different aspects of their identity sometimes. Um, it's, a, it's a source of peer-based information, uh, which is something that adolescents are very interested in, information about uh, coping, life, sexuality, a whole range of topics. Another thing that's very important about these digital devices is all of these processes are essentially private from parents. Uh, parents often have no uh, real capacity to monitor what adolescents are doing online. And uh, uh, even though they may, can, they may think they do, uh, some of our data suggests that they really don't have a very good idea of what adolescents are doing online. And adolescents are highly motivated to establish their independence by developing these independent means of communication. And then, of course, there's a, there's a literature as well on the phenomena of boredom proneness as a, as a phenomena that's related to adolescents. And, uh, and, and uh, digital devices are, are an instant form of, of, of social connection, connection and entertainment that can, uh, can address that. So for all of these reasons, we can see why digital devices fit in so nicely with uh, the core developmental tasks of adolescents. Now, another phenomenon that's very important in adolescence is the emergence of mental health problems. And this is a, a, a figure that shows uh, the, the burden of disease associated with different mental health problems across the lifespan. And uh, you can see that particularly depressive disorders, which is the blue line at the top there, uh, really do emerge dramatically during uh, late childhood and early adolescence and peak in early adulthood. And so this is a time of life where these kinds of disorders are really having a big effect on people's health. Um, and another thing that's been very much commented on is the idea that... Um, is the, is the observation that, at least in data from the United States, there's been uh, a, a, some notable increases in, um, in mental health problems that are particularly observable in young people, uh, as in this uh, figure here, the 18 to 25 group is showing an increase. And the onset of those increases is correlated uh, to some extent with the uh, onset of the use of social media in that group. And this has caused many people to conclude that social media must be somehow playing a causal role in this increase in mental health problems that we're observing. However, we do have to be uh, cautious about this conclusion for a number of reasons. Firstly, of course, as we all know, correlation is not causation. And just because two things are happening at the same time does not mean that one is causal to the other. You need to really understand that phenomena at greater depth. And there is a long history, of course, of technological panic uh, that, that occurs when a new technology comes on, on, uh, into the community. So here are a few examples from history. Here is an article uh, from uh, the, the, the turn of the, uh, the 19th to the 20th century about the phenomena of bicycle insanity, which was a, a, a mental health problem that was caused by people riding bicycles too much. It was particularly a problem for women uh, who, who were ex exercising some new independence with these infernal machines. Uh, and we can also see other examples such as uh, the debate about the phenomena of the automobile brain, which was a, a phenomena that showed how the um, how driving cars was going to uh, squish your brain into different shapes and so forth. So, you know, we do need to be uh, sceptical when there is this kind of technological panic about new technology and uh, assertions of its effects. Uh, we have recently uh, tried to look at this question quantitatively. We published a meta-analysis of the relationship between social media use and depressive symptoms in adolescents specifically, was published in the Journal of Affective Disorders last year. And if you're familiar with looking at these forest plots, as they're called, um, this shows you all the different studies that were included in the meta-analysis. And when, the, uh, when the, uh, the, the triangle or the square is, um, uh, is, is to the right of this uh, dotted line here, then that shows a positive correlation between social media use and depressive symptoms. So there's th two things you can observe from this meta-analysis. First of all, the overall correlation across all the studies, or association, I should say, across all the studies is very small in its effect size. 
And this is consistent with all the other meta-analyses that have been done on this topic. And secondly, there is enormous variability between different studies. So what this tells us is that we do need to be cautious because there's probably many, many different factors that are influencing whether people's use of social media is associated with depressive symptoms. Particularly, uh, you know, as you might imagine, that social media is a platform, but all sorts of things can happen on this platform, some of them very positive, potentially, and some of them uh, associated with risk. So there's a lot more we can say about that, and I imagine some of the other speakers might, um, might address it as well. Um, the question that I'm really interested in and that I'll spend the rest of my time discussing is the question of whether digital technology could actually be used in a positive way to enhance uh, adolescent mental health and can it solve uh, long-standing challenges in, um, uh, in mental health services and support that we've really been uh, struggling with for some time. So we have a range of challenges that we've been dealing with for a long time, such as access, how do people access mental health care? How do we target the mental health care where it's needed most? How do, we, how do we intervene early to prevent mental health problems rather than waiting until they become established? Uh, how do we ensure that there is good quality in the mental health services that we're delivering to people? How do we make sure that they're effective? Uh, how do we make sure we implement them with fidelity? And how can we disseminate them in a way uh, that, that really gets them out to the people who need them most? And these are all long-standing challenges in mental health care that uh, digital technology can be used to at least explore new ways of addressing them. And that's one of the things that makes uh, this area, I think, exciting and potentially positive. Um, so adolescence is a key leverage point for mobile computing and mental health because we have this confluence of different factors, the emergence of mental health disorders, their intensive use of mobile computing, and of course the high plasticity and learning uh, capacity that adolescents have because of the way uh, their, their lives are changing and the way their brain is developing and so forth. Now, in terms of uh, uh, looking at this particular question, I'm going to focus on a particular uh, methodology that we've been exploring a lot in our work, and there's a lot more to say than I can say in this brief presentation today, but we are very interested in this method called passive mobile sensing, which is the method of using the adolescent's personal smartphone to collect data continuously to understand patterns of behaviour uh, so that we can then deliver mental health services to the right people at the right time. Uh, obviously, uh, this needs to be done in a way that is uh, extremely uh, uh, careful with respect to security of those data and privacy. And I'm happy to answer further questions about that if, uh, if they come up in discussion. But the thing that, about these kinds of data that's really exciting is that they're objective, uh, they're collected in an unobtrusive way, you can, they're individualized and uh, they also can be collected in real time. And because we're using the consumer device that everybody already owns, uh, the method is highly scalable. It can be delivered to a lot of people. And in particular, with respect to uh, smartphones, one of the important things about smartphones that's reflected in these data is that they have high penetration across different levels of socioeconomic advantage versus disadvantage. So, for example, the, what these data show is that smartphones uh, amongst teenagers are, have show high levels of ownership uh, irrespective of the person's socioeconomic background, which is not true for other kinds of devices like uh, desktop or laptop computers. We have uh, developed a research tool uh, that we use to uh, collect these kinds of data and understand how these patterns of behaviour are associated with uh, mental health uh, states. And uh, we, we've developed methods as well of uh, taking those data and turning them into uh, uh, signals that are associated with things like uh, sleep, physical activity, uh, mood, social communication, cognition, et cetera, all markers of, um, that are fundamental uh, pillars of support for well-being and mental health. And the tool that we have developed is called the EARS tool. Uh, and it's available for researchers to use uh, through the App Store and the Play Store in iOS and Android. Um, and so just to give you a couple of examples, a couple of recent examples, uh, this is a, a summary of uh, the findings from a study that was published earlier this year in Digital Health, where we were using 
um, <clears throat> the uh, mobile sensing approach to track uh, uh, language use on the phone and to understand how it relates to uh, experiences of depression, stress, and also to inflammatory factors that were measured uh, with biomarkers. And uh, it's obviously a complex table, and I won't go into it in too much detail, but you can see uh, that many of these word measures here uh, do show strong associations with uh, measures of not only of, uh, of, of, um, of inflammatory factors, but also of measures of uh, depression and anxiety. And that's also consistent with another study here, which we did amongst 13 year olds, uh, where we collected uh, keyboard uh, data uh, and looked at, uh, their, at the language that kids were using in social media, and then co correlating that with their day-to-day -day variations in well-being and self-esteem. Uh, so for, and there's lots of uh, different findings here, but one that I'll just quickly emphasize is the, that we find, uh, as has been found before, that the use of first person pronouns is strongly associated with, with daily variations in well-being. So in other words, uh, as people's well-being uh, gets lower, we see more use of first person pronouns, terms like I and me and mine in English. And you can see this thick line represents the uh, relationship uh, across the group here. But the important thing also is that all of these individual regression lines represent uh, those data within, an in, within each individual in the study. And you can see that the vast majority of those individuals are showing this uh, slope that is characteristic of that relationship. So finally, um, I'll just say a couple of things about how we are applying these uh, methods in digital therapeutics. So we are developing apps at the moment and testing them uh, that use these kind of mobile sensing methodologies to collect data continuously and to understand how various patterns of behaviour are associated with mental health, day-to-day uh, -day variations in mental health in young people. And then we use those data in order to target which are the behaviours for this individual that we should be uh, trying to encourage and support, uh, whether it's changes in sleep, uh, social relationships, cognition, physical activity. And this is really a, uh, an application of a method uh, called behavioral activation. And then uh, and, and the, this, could, this system that we're, we've built consists not only of apps that the, that the adolescent can use, but also of uh, uh, dashboards that can be used by healthcare practitioners where the adolescent can choose to share their data with the healthcare practitioner, and then the uh, practitioner can share, uh, can, can examine those data, use them in their clinical assessment, and then build out a therapy plan that then gets pushed back out uh, to the person in their day-to-day -day life uh, through, the, through the use of nudges and notifications. Ultimately, we see an opportunity to have uh, a new way of approaching mental health care that is uh, uh, scalable, but also uh, varies uh, with respect to the intensity of intervention that the person receives, um, you know, it, ranging from self-care uh, through to uh, text-based uh, coaching, uh, telehealth and face-to-face -face therapy. But the really the important point here is that we want to build a system that allows people to move up and down these different levels of care that they need. Uh, in order to uh, get the right level of care at the right time without the friction that's associated with getting in and out of mental health care at the moment. All right, and with that, I'll, I'll thank you for your attention and, uh, and look forward to our discussion later. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Nick. Thank you so much. Just a quick question. Um, do you uh, experience that the adolescents are generous and, and willingly let you take their data or do, is that an issue? Um, <clears throat> obviously, yeah, so that's a quick, a quick answer to that question is that we actually find that uh, adolescents, young adolescents are quite wary. Uh, older adolescents and young adults are actually quite willing to share their data. And, um, and, you know, obviously we do everything technically that we can to ensure that those data are private and secure. But really at the end of the day, when people are sharing their data, what they want to do is get value for sharing those data. The reason people use a product like Google Maps is because it's a really useful product. And so at the end of the day, what we need to do is show that to people that these data are actually valuable to them, that they are in control of how it's used, 
and that it can be valuable in their healthcare. And and uh, and that's 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 the way we talk to them about it. But certainly, some people are not comfortable with it, and we understand that. Uh, but but at the end of the day, we believe that these kinds of digital data are going to be a really normal part of healthcare in the future. And um, because the uh, the value that they add to healthcare is really significant. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I can imagine that that a whole lot of them want to contribute to something good. So, so uh, I, I see that they want to share their data. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, and please uh, stay on for some more questions uh, later on. Thank you. So we are now ready for our next speaker for today, Dr. Jacqueline Nessie. Now, Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior at the Brown University. Uh, also in the US, in Rhode Island. Uh, and you're also a clinical psychologist at the Rhode Island Hospital. Jacqueline, I guess it's good morning to you too. Early morning. Yes, good morning. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you. Um, welcome. And uh, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, can you see my slides okay here? Yes, yes. It's very good. All right, great. Uh, well, thank you so much for, for inviting me here, um, you know, and thank you, Nick, for that uh, really interesting presentation. I'm so grateful to have this opportunity today to uh, discuss the current landscape of research on adolescent mental health and social media use, um, including a bit of my own work, and um, to discuss some opportunities for intervention and change in this space. So my first few slides will reiterate a little bit of what Dr. Allen has said. Um, and so I'll go quickly through those and then I'll really try to focus my talk on uh, digging into some of the risks and benefits of adolescent social media use. But just briefly, um, social media is uh, can be thought of as really any digital tools that allow for social interaction. I have a longer definition here that I won't uh, won't read through. This is from Carr and Hayes um, for later reference. Uh, but most of us kind of know about social media based on the sites that are most popular. So things like Facebook, which has billions of users worldwide, YouTube, TikTok. Um, and we know that social media use is nearly ubiquitous among adolescents. It's a, a key component of adolescents' lives. We also know that. Um, uh, as we heard in earlier presentations um, over this uh, summit, that one in seven adolescents have a mental disorder in the world. And that over the past 10 to 15 years, the rates of uh, mental disorders in many countries have increased. And of course, at the same time, the adoption of social media has risen. And you can see from this graph here, which where each line is a different social media site, um, just how exponential that rise has been. And as Dr. Allen said, the, the co-occurrence of these two trends has really led to some concern about potential links between the two. But taking together the full body of research, including recent uh, meta-analyses um, focused on depression and suicidal thoughts and behavior, you know, we really find that um, there are the associations between time spent on social media and mental health tend to be somewhat mixed, somewhat variable. And if they're significant, they tend to be small. Um, so where does that leave us? Does this mean that social media use is irrelevant to teens' mental health? Uh, of course not. Instead, I think these average effects mask really a number of important factors, all of which point to the really critical nature of social media in teens' mental health. So this includes uh, the fact that um, Social media impacts different teens in different ways. Uh, some may be more vulnerable, vulnerable than others, as well as the fact that there are, of course, benefits and risks to using social media, depending on how it is used. Um, and I think by understanding these individual differences, as well as these risks and benefits, we can really identify opportunities to intervene and support youth in using social media in healthy ways. So two broad areas that I wanna discuss when it comes to the impact of social media on teens' mental health. Uh, the first is social interactions, including of course, both positive and negative social interactions online, as well as mental health content, meaning 
posts, photos, messages, information generally that specifically references mental health on social media, again, both positive and negative. Of course, the distinction between these two is somewhat artificial when it comes to social media, but I think it's a useful way to frame this conversation. So within each of these categories, social interaction and mental health con content, I wanna briefly mention how the features or kind of affordances of social media as a technology actually change some of these processes, I think in important ways. So for example, when social interaction happens online versus when it happens in person, it tends to be more public. There's a larger audience. Um, these interactions are available at any time uh, from any location, again, not limited by geography. There tends to be fewer interpersonal cues, things like tone of voice and facial expression, which can lead to online disinhibition, people saying and doing things they weren't, wouldn't normally um, in person, again, for good and for bad. And it tends to be what I called inescapable um, with something like bullying at the end of the day, if a teen comes home, um, the bullying can still take place outside of the school context really at any time. So now I just wanna talk um, about how um, these experiences on social media may create benefits or risks for teens' mental health. And then I'll talk about what this tells us um, in terms of opportunities for intervention. So first thinking about the risks of social interactions on social media. One clear risk um, that we see is the presence of hate speech um, and racist language. So a recent survey nationally representative in the US from Common Sense Media suggests that almost 70% of US uh, youth of color report sometimes or often encountering racist content online. Another risk we run, we run into um, in terms of teens' mental health is uh, social comparison, um, which uh, tends to be facilitated by the online environment, as well as status seeking. So recent experimental work suggests that uh, in some cases, when teens receive fewer likes um, on their posts or photos, it can be linked to greater emotional distress. Interpersonal stress is also um, a key area of risk in this domain. So the most clear example of this is cyber victimization. Um, and there have various meta-analyses, including a recent one from my team, have suggested that cyber victimization is consistently linked with poor mental health, including suicidal thoughts and behaviors, depressive symptoms, um, as well as externalizing symptoms. And then throughout the rest of my talk, I'll give a few examples um, from my work. A lot of this is going to focus more specifically on youth with um, experiences of suicidal thoughts or behavior, although many of the principles apply generally to youth with a range of mental health concerns. But I'll talk a little bit about data from a study I recently completed funded by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, AFSP. Um, these are youth recruited from a psychiatric hospital setting. Um, with significant mental health concerns. And the study included a number of measures, but I'll focus a bit on interviews, uh, which I'll provide some quotes from, um, as well as data collected directly from their social media pages. So this is one quote from a teen in the study, which speaks to interpersonal stress and cyber victimization online. So the teen talks about how on social media, um, people feel that they can hide sort of behind the screen um, and pick on you. She also talks about how social media can be more hurtful than in-person bullying, because when it happens on social media, um, she says it's posted everywhere. It's everywhere. So really speaking to this public aspect. Now thinking about some of the benefits of social media when it comes to social interaction. The most clear benefit here, I think, is, of course, social connection, which in the U.S., um, statistics from Pew suggest that 81% of teens say that social media allows them um, to be more connected to friends. We also know that social support is critical for youth with mental health concerns um, and that youth with mental health concerns are more likely to engage in this support seeking online. Um, online only friends or friends who have never been met in person um, is another aspect of social media use. Um, we know that youth with mental health concerns are more likely, again, to have online only friends. And we also know that youth who may not have as supportive a community of peers in their offline lives, such as sexual and gender minority youth, also may be more likely to have online only friends who may provide that support. 
And then just briefly to demonstrate the, the benefits uh, of online only friends, this comes from a study from my colleagues and I led by Maya Massing Schaefer at UNC, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, this is in a sample of 600 adolescents recruited from the community. And in this sample, we found that generally uh, youth who had been relationally victimized offline uh, were more likely to experience suicidal ideation one year later, except if they had at least one online-only friend. So online-only friends were providing some sort of protection, some benefit to these youth, perhaps in the form of social support. So now thinking about these risks and benefits of social interaction online, I wanna think about opportunities. How can we intervene to encourage youth to use social media in healthy ways? When I say we, I think it's important to note that we're talking here about you know, various stakeholders, um, clinicians, educators, legislators, um, social media companies, teens themselves. Um, so first, I think we can educate youth through media literacy type programs and other ways uh, about the prevalence of hate speech and bullying. We can teach them about the harms of engaging in these behaviors. We can teach them perspective taking skills, um, remind them that what they say online in many cases is permanent, um, provide that education. We can also empower youth, um, giving them tools to cope when they encounter this type of interaction online and teach them to intervene when they see cyberbullying occur. We can also guide youth, and particularly this can be done in the design of social media platforms themselves. We can guide your youth towards social connection, perhaps towards more messaging type activities, these positive aspects of social media, rather than driving uh, social comparison towards likes and views and status indicators. So the second category that I'll talk about, as I mentioned, is uh, mental health content. Um, so this is information about mental health available online. Uh, the offline equivalent would be, you know, exposure to discussion or information about mental health just in the in the real world. And so online, I think the difference between how this happens online versus in person is so much in the scale. So there's just so much more content online, um, unlimited really resources and information, but also of course, access to more harmful content. Um, it's also easily accessible, um, accessible immediately at any point. Um, it can be privately accessed, um, of course comes from a variety of sources. Um, and because social media tends to be driven as well by algorithms that are personalized to the user, this type of content can be directly targeted to the user, again, for, I think, positive and negative. So here we'll start a little bit with the benefits. So there are some amazing benefits, of course, to social media here. It's just so many resources available. It's easily accessible. Um, this comes from um, uh, the Origin group led by Joe Robinson in Australia. Um, uh, it's a campaign called Chat Safe, uh, which uh, has been working towards suicide prevention in the country and now offers resources worldwide. We know that social media can also be an opportunity for stigma reduction. Um, this comes from uh, uh, a post or a hashtag that was popular for Mental Health Awareness Month around breaking the stigma. We also see opportunities for self-expression among teens, um, for teens who may be going through difficulties and opportunities for intervention in many cases. If this might be one way that we're able to identify teens who are struggling by their posts or their messaging on social media. And I'll just share this one quote from a 12 year old female, again, which set, speaks to this sense of, of um, maybe stigma reduction online, you know, knowing that she's not alone in her struggles with mental health. She says, it's nice to know, you know, that I'm not the only one. And now I'll just present two slides uh, discussing the, the risks of certain mental health content on social media. So the first is difficulties with verifying information and, and exposure to misinformation. So this comes from TikTok. Um, this is what happens if you search for the hashtag TikTok therapist. Um, as of when I last looked, it had 461 million views. So clearly there's a need for this type of content. Um, but of course, some of these posts may be from actual therapists or mental health professionals. 
Many of them are not. Many of them are from influencers, um, even friends of a teen. And so it can be hard for teens to really evaluate where the truth lies in some of this content. We also know there's some evidence that exposure to content that depicts risky behaviors, whether that's substance uh, use, uh, dangerous behaviors through things like TikTok challenges, um, may increase risk for engaging in these behaviors. And then finally, I'll talk a bit about suicide-related content. So this is, you know, posts and photos and messages that relate somehow to suicide or self-injury. Um, and this chart comes from a study that I recently conducted. This was with um, uh, almost 600 psychiatrically hospitalized teens. And, and in that group, I just want to point out uh, one number here, which is that about a quarter of these teens reported that they had viewed content related to self-injury online. Um, and so this isn't, this isn't a small number, particularly among vulnerable youth. And then I just want to provide a quick example as well of what this type of content might look like on social media. This has all been edited slightly to protect um, participant confidentiality. But this type of post um, was shared by a teen in the study I described earlier. Um, they post this on, on social media um, uh, with a photo and, of course, describing, um, describing thoughts about suicide. Um, they described that this was actually on a vent account. Uh, which is a specific Instagram account that they created as a way to kind of share how they're feeling. And then I have two quotes here that talk about how teens view some of this content online. Um, so this first, um, first adolescent talk, um, I think potential for sort of normalization kind of processes that may take place when it comes to suicide related content online and particularly in particular, she says, you know, I won't post this type of stuff, but other people in my school do. Um, some people think it's cool to do that. They think, um, they think of it as a trend. She says, I think they like the attention. Um, but then another teen, I like this quote because I think it really speaks to the challenge here and, and to the dichotomy of what we see with these type of posts, which is, you know, she says, I feel like it's said often that people are looking for attention when they post this kind of thing, um, but it's not always a bad thing. You know, why would you post something like this if you didn't want help? Um, and that really, I think, is the struggle here is how do we identify when teens are posting this as a way to look for help? Um, and how can we balance the possibility for sort of normalization, maybe contagion in some cases versus the need um, for support? So in terms of opportunities that I think this, this speaks to, um, or how we can intervene. Uh, first, I think, you know, we, again, we can educate youth. So this may be, again, through media literacy type efforts on how to determine the accuracy of the content that they're viewing online, how to identify misinformation, um, uh, how to verify the sources of the things that they're viewing. We can empower youth to slow down when they use social media. I think they can, we often uh, hear teens describe social media use as mindless, um, but they can use social media in more mindful ways. And we can teach them to do that, to take a second, to think for themselves, when is this content helpful for me? When is it harmful? And in what moments is that true? And we can guide youth, again, with the help of social media companies and design of products themselves, guide them towards more of these helpful resources, helpful information and true content, um, and away from some of the more harmful content. But briefly, just a few key takeaways. Uh, social media, of course, is nearly ubiquitous among teens. Um, it's not going away, it's going to stay. And so we know that it presents both benefits and risks for adolescents' mental health. In order to maximize the opportunities that teens have with using social media, we really need collaboration among these, uh, these key stakeholders that I mentioned. Um, and in doing so, I think we do have an opportunity to help youth take advantage of these benefits of social media while really minimizing the risks. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline, so much. Uh, just a quick question. When you, uh, you talk about the different uh, parts of society, that we, uh, all, all of those um, different parts, need to work together. Uh, how about the parents? What's the most important? Maybe this is a big question, but if you can answer it quite shortly. <laughs> yeah. What's the most important thing to do as a parent? Yeah, I think that that is a, a really important question here. And I'll say just, just briefly, I think that um, for a parent, I think it really comes down to open communication. So I think that uh, parents really want to be encouraging their um, their teens to talk to them about what's going on online. Um, and so that sometimes that means really taking a, a non-judgmental stance when it comes to your teens' online activities. Um, to be open when they come and share difficulties that they're having online. Um, I think it's critical that, that the, the conversation remains, remains open. Mm. Thank you. I, I know this is a big topic, so we can maybe come back to it. But thank you so much for now. And uh, please stay on, because now uh, we are ready for our third speaker. Um, it's now time for me to introduce uh, Dr. Madeline George, Public Health Research Analyst at RTI International in North Carolina. So good morning, Madeline. Your research includes adolescents' mental health, risk-taking, relationships and digital technology use and how the frequency and content on social media relates to offline behaviours and well-being. So uh, welcome, Madeline. Uh, please, the screen is yours. Thank you so much. Um, and I wanted to say thanks to everybody for coming. Um, I was having a little issues with my with my uh, time zone change, but I'm here now. Um, You're here now, so take a deep breath and uh, good morning, and let's see your presentation. <laughs> yeah, hold on. Let me just share my screen. Of course. Excellent. We can see it good now. Okay. Perfect. Great. Um, so yeah, today I'll be talking a little bit about social media use and adolescent well-being. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. So even before COVID, there was a lot of discussion about adolescents' mental health and well-being. And over the past decade, there has been increases in adolescent symptoms of depression and other symptoms. So this worrying trend People have gotten concerned over it, and we can see that there's been this worldwide increase in loneliness. Um, although when you look at the graph, you actually see it's only a small, about 0.2 point increase. So we see this graph, and we also can look at on the second graph, we can see a small increase over the pandemic period that we're seeing these specific changes in loneliness and poor mental health. And a lot of people are asking and gotten concerned What's causing this? And increasingly, we're seeing in the media that people are saying it's screen time, it's social media. But what does the research actually show? Um, so in the media, we can see these headlines. Uh, we see that they, uh, people are saying that it's specifically social media that's causing an increase in depression and loneliness. But when you actually uh, look at the different um, uh, trends, you can see that it sounds very similar to other trends that have happened in the past. So if you look at this uh, lower left, uh, lower right hand um, section, you can see that people were saying the same things in the 1890s about technology. And the new form of technology at that point was books, dime store novels. Uh, people were reading, where kids were reading these fictional novels like Sherlock Holmes, Dracula, all of that stuff and they were getting into their own world. And uh, people were blaming that on them not being present and not being fully invested in their real lives. Um, so it, th is this really a new phenomenon or is this just another form of tech panic? Are parents just concerned for possibly nothing? Um, as Douglas Adams said, anything that is in the world when you're born is just a natural part of the way the world works. Anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new, exciting, and revolutionary. And anything that's invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. The media will soon be run by people who grew up with iPhones. 
So maybe it's just another tech panic, but let's dig into the science and see is social media, is screen time, is that different for some reason for adolescents in this day and age? So when we look at some of the data across people, we can see a few different things. Adolescents who spend more time on technology, on screens, they report lower well being, greater mental health symptoms, they sleep fewer hours in the night, they report more chaos at home and more problems with parents related to their technology usage. And we see that there's these general adolescents who report more tech use generally have more problems with tech. And this um, is uh, and here's a graph you can see that as adolescents use tech, there's a little bump in well-being, and then the more that they use it, increasing number of hours is related to poor well-being. But wait, let's consider a few things. First, these studies that we are looking at are all looking at small effect sizes. So when we say technology use is related to well-being. These graphs often find correlations of about 0 0.05 and at most 0 0.10. So what that looks like when you're trying to describe an overlap is this tiny little area that covers technology usage and well-being. So the overlap is only is less than a percentage point. So there's not actually a whole lot that technology is telling us about well-being if you think about it in that respect. If you, also, if you also think about it in terms of effect sizes, you can look, you can put it into the context of what else is related to teens well-being. In this graph, um, and these are both pulled from Orban, um, Amy Orban and, and Andy Shabilsky, who have done amazing work on this topic. Um, and if you look at this graph and you see what else is related to adolescent well-being, you can see that uh, technology usage is there's a larger effect size for glasses as compared to technology usage. So perhaps my glasses are causing me to have more depression than my technology usage. Obviously, I don't think researchers are saying that, but you need to put this into the context of there are a lot of things that could be related to well-being and what is the effect size and it, are there other factors that may be stronger than technology usage. Third, there's all, these studies often also capture these very broad measures of well-being and very broad measures of technology usage. So in looking at tech, they often just ask people how much time a day do you spend using technology? And these are not good measures. Uh, we're not good at remembering how much time we spend doing something. And so when we ask somebody how much time you spend on an average weekday, these are these could be many different hours, you could be doing many different activities, and they are also probably going to be very uh, broad, so it's not going to capture what you want to capture. You're not capturing any type of specificity. So there's a very big difference between gaming, social media use, watching TV, all of these different types of screen times are all often summed into one measure, and it's not a good measure. Finally, I want to I want to point out a big thing that has been a major hallmark of my research, which is distinguishing between between person and within person processes. So all of these studies mostly look at between people. And what that means is, is let's say I have two people. Participant A uses technology a lot and participant B uses technology a little. And I say, OK, well, Participant A has these characteristics, and so, and they're higher than participant B. So I compare between these two different people. I'm comparing across people. I say, this participant A um, uses technology more and is more depressed as compared to participant B. But this is not necessarily how uh, we can look at causality. We got to look at what's happening within individuals and how this process changes over time. So that's where we get into within people processes. So we can also compare within individuals. So within both participant A and B, we get them both in the study and we compare them over time. So for example, I can compare um, days 
uh, two and six in participant A, and those are the days that they use more technology. Do they have more depression on those days compared to themselves on days in which they use less technology? And in this way, we can control for all of these person level effects, their gender, their race, their a lot of these different factors because they serve as their own control. And importantly, when we look at these effects, they can have very different, uh, they can show very different patterns. So people can be, there can be differences between people and there can be differences within people and these can be very different. So let's explain. When in the studies that I explained before, we saw that adolescents who use more tech had higher mental health symptoms. But when you look at adolescents within themselves on days in which they use more technology, there was no difference in the mental health symptoms that they reported on those days. There was no difference in the amount of sleep that they reported. And there was no difference in the amount of positive offline uh, interaction with their parents. So looking within individuals, we don't see the same traits or same problems as we maybe see between individuals. And we can explain this a bit with theory. So typically the theory goes that as adolescents are using technology, they're displacing time spent on social activities that they should be interacting with other individuals. Um, so as they spend more time on screens, they're not spending time with friends or with parents or interacting um, in these normal social activities. And so this is what people have suggested and there seems to be these trends. However, this is a within person process. So th this is saying that um, there should be causality on these different days. However, if we think about this in a different way, if we think about this as a between person process, the adolescents who are lacking social skills or who have more problems in their everyday lives may be interacting online differently and behaving online differently, then we can start to see that maybe it's a between person process. So adolescents who lack the social skills may spend more time online or may interact differently online to compensate for those offline problems. And now we're placing the blame not on technology, but on other factors that may be important for their mental health. And we're placing the technology as a symptom of what is already happening in their offline lives. And this hypothesis fits better with at least the research that I've conducted and other, others that have conducted that are doing more longitudinal or intensive work. So what should we be concerned about? Uh, instead of thinking about the amount of time adolescents spend on social media or the amount of their technologies in general, perhaps we need to think about who is having um, more problems. So in fitting with, these, with this hypothesis, think about who is the teen? What is the characteristics of that teen? What are they already struggling with? What are the offline predictors that may lead to greater online problems. Um, what are they doing online and when are they online? So in thinking about who, um, uh, we've done some research to look at which are the adolescents who may experience more technology impairment or spillover from offline to online problems or vice versa. And we found that Adolescents who come from more disadvantaged or low income backgrounds tend to report that they have greater issues online. They experience more bullying online and they experience um, more uh, problems in dealing with disconnection from offline environments. Um, and so this may be replicating offline vulnerabilities and offline problems that they're already and, and offline disadvantages that they're already experiencing. So we already know that maybe we should be focused on teens who need more assistance and not, it's not necessarily bad for everyone, but for some teens, there may be greater risks involved. Next. Thinking about what? 
it's not just screen time is one thing. Um, just as adolescents are not a monolith, social media use is not one activity. So instead, thinking about what adolescents are doing online and how they interact with that environment and how that interacts with their personality. So this is an experiment that was um, led by Caitlin Burnell. And she um, and we what we did was is we had uh, a young adults go into the lab. They would either look at their own profile for 10 minutes, they would look at an assigned acquaintance's profile for 10 minutes, or they would look at an influencer's page for 10 minutes. And we looked at their um, well being and their affect before and after. And what you can see is, is that for those who looked at their own page, they actually, um, the, this first bar, uh, they actually felt a little bit better after looking at their own page. Um, this was a, a somewhat enjoyable activity. They maybe reminisced about their um, good posts. However, if they looked at an influencer's or at an acquaintance's profile, they saw this slight dip in well-being, um, especially in greater feelings of envy and jealousy. And this points to the fact that they might be socially comparing themselves to others as these effects were only found and pronounced higher for those who had, who had a tendency to compare themselves and who had the highest levels of FOMO. So it matters both what you're doing, are you, um, what are you looking at and who you are. Are you somebody who will see these things and compare yourself to them? And finally, thinking about when social, when adolescents are using technology. Um, it, perhaps even though they don't, they sleep just the same amount of time, is it disrupting them at night? Are they using it during the day while they should be in school? Um, what, are, what, are their, what are they doing on their devices and when? So I'd like to close with the fact that adolescents are not just using technology. Uh, just because it's new and exciting. They're using it to stay connected with peers. It's really about relationships. Adolescence is a time for changing social roles, developing your identity, and becoming independent. And social media in particular offers a space that I don't think that any other space in their offline lives does. It offers a place where they can be, they can express themselves, explore their identities, and connect with their peers in a way that's relatively unsupervised and open for their own interpretation. So a lot, of, a, a lot of teens will say, it's not the technology I'm addicted to, it's my friends. I go on there because it's a place where I can be myself. Um, so for parents, talk to your kids, model good behavior, engage and mediate. This is, there is no one screen time that's good or bad. It's what works for you and your family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you. Um, I have a question to, to all of you uh, now that we've recently we followed the news on the Facebook whistleblower. I think maybe all of you have seen this and heard about it. It's the, the employee at Facebook who testified that Facebook actually knew that some posts on Facebook were a risk to, for example, teenage girls. Now, what's your thought about this? And if you look ahead, the years ahead, what do you think about regulations when it comes to content in social media and, uh, and perhaps in, in regards to adolescence as well and, and mental health. Um, uh, if, I, if I ask you, Nick, first, what do you say? Are you still with us, Nick? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Good. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I, I'm really fascinated to hear others' views about this, but uh, honestly, looking at the, at, the, at the research that was presented by the Facebook whistleblower, I think, you know, it really contained nothing surprising, nothing that really isn't already in the research literature. And to be blunt, overall, it was fairly poor quality research, you know, like it was relying extensively on retrospective self-reports, you know, uh, personal narratives about what, what, you know, social media, and we've seen from the excellent presentations today, the need to actually ask questions in a more sophisticated way in order to come to these causal conclusions. So I think that 
in and of itself, the research was not surprising and it was not um, it was not particularly groundbreaking. I think obviously the thing that made it titillating was that it was internal research and that it wasn't, uh, it, it, you know, the question of, of how seriously it was taken by Facebook as an organisation in terms of their safety uh, procedures and their, and their product design. Um, so I think it's, 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 personally, I think it's great that it's, it's, um, it's prompted a public debate about this issue. I think that's very positive. Uh, but the research in and of itself was not, was not surprising or groundbreaking uh, at all. I'd love to hear what, what Jackie and, and, and Madeline have to say. Mm. Jacqueline, what do you say if you look ahead when it comes to regulations within social media? Maybe this in, in hindsight, but what, what do you say about that in general? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I agree with um, what Dr. Allen had to say. Um, you know, I think that, again, the, the revelations um, really don't tell us anything new about uh, relationships between social media use and mental health in teens. I, I think probably more so what the what the revelations speak to is maybe a need for greater transparency in terms of um, what is uh, what these social company social media companies are learning, um, the type of data that they're collecting. Um, I think it probably also speaks to the need for um, for these groups to kind of be working together to answer these questions. So meaning social media companies, researchers and legislators as well to, to sort of figure out what, what can be done to really um, to benefit teens and to pr protect their mental health. Mm. And Madeline, do you agree or, or do you see something different uh, if you look ahead in your crystal bowl when it comes to regulations on social media? No, I wholeheartedly agree. I definitely think social, I would love if social media companies would allow us access to their data. I think that that is the main way that we're going to find out what is really happening. We know they collect data on all of us. And so we know there's access to data. And as Nick said, there was that the data that they were using was not, it's, that's not the big data. We know that there's much bigger data sets going on and that's where we would like to be able to look at that. Yes, I think there can be some regulations, but without really delving into these, into the bigger data, we're not going to be able to know what to, to look for. Mm. Okay, well, thank you so much, all three of you. Uh, there are a few questions more in the chat, and it's been an engaging chat, and, and people are writing questions to you, but we don't have any more time, I'm afraid. But thank you so much for being with us, um, all three of you. Uh, we're now going to have a short, a mini short break, and then it's time for all of you uh, joining the workshops to go find your links for the workshops and go work there uh, in the afternoon. And the rest of us, We'll hear from you tomorrow on your short summaries of that workshops. Uh, let me just say that today's workshops is, is for, it's um, addressing peripartum depression, public mental health promotion as an integral part of clinical and community care programs, how to improve access to evidence-based psycho psychological interventions, and animal-assisted uh, interventions for children with mental health challenges in the schools. Very interesting. So those of you uh, going to the workshops, you need to have like two minute break and then go into your different links. And um, tomorrow, which is the last day of our summit, we will focus more on pathways to lifelong mental well-being on topics like sleep, uh, the importance of nature and the importance of self acceptance. So more about that tomorrow. But thank you so much to all the speakers and all the participants for today and see you tomorrow at uh, two o'clock Swedish local time. But bye for now.